Okay, so I'm recording this at lunch. There might be some noise around, but I'm sure you'll manage. Um, I want to talk about doing the mechanics, the work you'd write down for doing a hypothesis test on a single proportion. So this is going to be my sample question I'm going to work with. We have a sociologist wondering if today's high school students are less likely to have taken music lessons than 20 years ago, when around 60% of high school students had. He selects 220 students from around the U.S. and finds 112 have taken music lessons. Does this give statistically significant evidence at the 5% significance level to conclude students are less likely to have taken music than 20 years ago? So, there's a lot of things in this question. I'll talk about what's meant by the significance level near the end, but most of the rest of this is pretty straightforward. 20 years ago, it was around 60%. He selects a sample of 220 and finds 112 have. If you divide those, that's around 51%, so it's gone down. But is the question is, has it gone down enough that we can conclude that this 60% number from 20 years ago is too high, and actually now it's lower? So, I'm going to show you the mechanics of how we make that decision. What we're going to do is we're going to compute a p-value and use that to make our decision. Several steps. First, we have to write hypotheses. So the null hypothesis is always the nothing has changed, there is no effect, things are as they always have sort of value. So if that's the case here, then it would still be 60%. And then the alternate is what we're trying to prove. So we're trying to prove it's less than 60%. These are perfectly good hypotheses to write for tests. P equals 0 0.60, P equals less than 0 0.60. Notice these are not P hats. We don't write hypotheses about the sample values. We know the sample value. The p hat is 112 out of 220. This is about the population. But you can't just write this. You have to say what this letter p represents in the context of the problem up here. So that would be, you would write something like this, where p is the proportion of high school students um, who've taken music lessons. So that way you are making it real clear to the reader, I know what this P represents, it represents this. So, we are trying to prove the alternate hypothesis. We want to show it's less than 60%. What we're going to do is we're going to assume it actually hasn't changed. The reason we do that is we're going to compute some probabilities. We want to be able to numerically evaluate whether this 112 out of 220 is so far from what we'd expect, if there had been no change, that we can reject that null hypothesis. We need to assume something. In this case, we're going to assume that P is still 60%, so that we can actually compute probabilities. Without making that assumption, we're just guessing about, okay, it seems like it's far enough away. So, Before we do the test, of course, there's always conditions. And the good news is the conditions are pretty much the same for confidence intervals. Uh, is it a random sample? Well, the problem doesn't say. We'll hope it is. We can't tell from the text if it's random. It says selected. Um, NP, NQ, at least 10. That's what we check for proportions, if you recall. Um, uh, yes, this is true. One thing to note here, this is really the only difference between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, is that these values here the 60 and the 40, these are not p-hats. You use the assumption, we're assuming that this is the actual value of p, so we use 60% and 40% here, rather than with a confidence interval, we would put p-hats in here. That's the only change. It doesn't usually make a big difference, though if one's greater than 10, the other one usually will be, but you have to use the right value. So for hypothesis tests, this is null hypothesis values, not p-hats. Last condition is the same as before. Sample size less than 10% of the population. That's clearly true here. 220 is less than 10% of all high school students. Oops, I should have had 10% in there. My apologies. That's the conditions. So, computing, actually computing and running the test, getting the, doing the numbers, is a two-step process. First, you're going to get what is called a test statistic. And this test statistic will be used to compute a probability. Most of our test statistics are Z or T scores, which always use the same value. You're going to have an observed value, 
minus an expected value divided by some sort of standard error. And that's the case here. Our observed value is p hat. That's what we observed when I took our sample. We had 112 oops, up here, out of 220. So observed values come from the sample. That's our observed p hat. The expected value is based on the null hypothesis. We are assuming that it hasn't changed. It's still 60%. And then, like we said before, is 112 out of 220 significantly less than what we expect? So this is computing the difference between the observed and the expected value. And then what we do is we normalize it. We turn it into a z-score by dividing by the standard error of the p-hats. And again, this is this familiar root p q over n, where these p and q are coming from the null hypothesis. So let's run the numbers, and we'll get our test statistic here. This is going to be a, a z-score. So there's my p-hat, 112 out of 220. There's my p, 60% from the null hypothesis, divided by root p q over n. And I get my calculator out, and I run some numbers, and I get a z-score of negative 2.75. So this observed value is 2 and 3 quarters standard deviations below what you would expect if there actually had been no change. We're going to use this test statistic to compute what's called a p-value, and we, use, we make our decision based on the p-value. Uh, as I mentioned on Friday and it was also in the other video, the p-value is, if the null were true, what's the probability of getting our observed result or even stronger evidence for the alternate? So the p-value is based on the assumption, if the null were true. So we're going to draw what the sampling distribution would look like if the null were true. So if the null were true, we'd have... Z equals zero here would represent getting an observed p-hat of 60%. We actually got a p-hat way down here. 2.76 standard deviations below what you'd expect. So the p-value is the probability of our observed results or even stronger evidence for the no, for the alternate, rather. And if you remember the alternate, we were looking for less than. So stronger evidence would be to the left. If we got a p hat even smaller, that would be stronger evidence. So when you do your p value, you're going to be computing normal probabilities or t probabilities. The direction you shade under your curve is going to be given by the alternate hypothesis. Since the alternate hypothesis was less than, then um, we're going to shade to the left here. And this is a norm CDF calculation. The sampling distribution is normal. For proportions, it's a normal distribution. And when I do my norm CDF calculation, I get this p-value is 0 0.0029. That's my p-value. And this number is what we use to make our decision. We make our decision based on this value. If this is small, then this gives us strong evidence. Sorry, uh, iPad pause. I'm not sure where it left off. If this is small, this gives us strong evidence against the null hypothesis and in favor of the alternate. The line of thought here is, if the null were true, what we got, our observed value, is extremely unlikely. We would only see about three times in a thousand would we get a value this low or lower if the null were true. So let's think about what that tells us. That tells us that we have one of two choices here. We can say, well, the null, maybe the null is true, and just by chance, we got an extremely unlikely result. That, of course, is possible. It could be that there was no change, that it's still 60% of students who take music lessons, and we, by chance, got an unlikely result. And there's really no way to tell whether we got that or not. We're taking a chance when we make our conclusions here. Our conclusions are probabilistic in nature. The other choice we can make is we could say, well, if the null were true, this would be very unlikely. And so we're going to reject the null hypothesis and say, because this would be so unlikely if the null were true, we're going to say, well, it seems reasonable to say maybe the null is not true any longer. Maybe, in fact, 
the alternate is true. So the question becomes, how low is low enough? What's the small enough value to say, okay, this is unlikely enough, we're going to reject this null hypothesis? And the answer is it comes back to the significance level that was on the front page. The significance level is how small the p-value has to be before you will reject the null hypothesis. The, st the most common um, significance levels are 1%, 5% and 10%, although they are certainly not written in stone. So from the front of our sheet, I'm not going to go back to it, uh, the p-value was 5, or the, excuse me, the significance level was 5%, and that, this is less than 5%. So we will reject the null hypothesis, and make sure you write this in your conclusion, with p less than 0.05, so you're telling what do you see about this p-value that leads you to make your conclusion, the p-value is small. It's less than the alpha. It's less than the significance level. With p less than 5%, and we write our conclusion, and the conclusion needs to be in the context of the problem. You can't just say, we reject the null hypothesis. We have to say, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude the proportion of high school students who have taken music lessons is less than 50%, 60%, rather. And we might be wrong, because... We could, this shows us the likelihood that we would make this decision, likelihood of getting this result even if the null were true, and that's the chance we're taking. We don't get ironclad decision, uh, conclusions in statistics. They're all probabilistic in nature. So this is how we do a one-proportion uh, z-test, and we'll learn about how to do the others as we go on. We'll move through them pretty quickly. Thank you for listening.